So welcome everyone. I am Priyanka. I'll be the host uh, of this webinar for this uh, evening along with Clara. And we're both from the Space Generation Advisory Council and we present this first uh, webinar series, masterclass series uh, on the European astronaut selection. And the topic of the first uh, webinar would be why do we need more women astronauts? So, and joining us are two extremely uh, achieved speakers. First is Dr. Mikhaila Musilova from, she's the director of High Seas Analog Station, uh, Analog Station in Hawaii. And we also have with us Professor Virginia Watering. Uh, she's a professor of human performance in space at the International Space University. And I will introduce our speakers uh, just before their talk. And before that, I would I would like to uh, once again welcome everyone to this webinar. And I'd like to um, let you know certain rules. The first one is I'd request everyone to switch off their um, mics as well as cameras to save bandwidth. Um, and also, I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. So uh, over to you, Klaha. Thank you. So now that you know a little bit more about the uh, speakers and the moderators, I uh, want to once again welcome you and we want to know more about you. So uh, we kindly ask you to join the Slido um, so you can use your phone or your computer and using the hashtag 070809. Uh, so we will have a couple of questions uh, coming in as the webinar is still ongoing, so we advise you to keep it active. And the first question we have for you is, where do you come from? So you can write your country, um, your city. I already um, saw a lot of different countries in the chat. Okay, awesome. We have people from many different places, uh, lots from France, Germany, a lot of people from um, from Europe, which is uh, which is normal, but also from all over the world. That's great. So we will keep this poll active. Uh, please continue answering uh, the the question, and I think uh, while you are answering, I will uh, present very briefly HGAC. If you can, yes, perfect. So AGAC is the Space Generation Advisory Council. So it's a global non-governmental and non-profit organization and network in support of the United Nations program on space application. It was created uh, more than 20 years ago and uh, it aims at representing university students and young space professionals from all over the world as we are today. I'm looking at uh, the poll and we have people from many different places even someone from the ISS, that's awesome. Uh, I wish it could be true, <laughs> maybe it is, but... Um, and so AGAC represents more than 150 countries, so I don't think we are 150 countries, but we have definitely many countries tonight, and it includes more than 15,000 members. So every year, AGAC organized around 30 events. Uh, of course, last year was a bit different, uh, but we had uh, almost 100 webinars, uh, which was a great success. So if you want to join the organization, uh, you can register on their website and uh, you can have a look at their 10 project groups, uh, their numerous partners and scholarships. Uh, there is room for everyone, really, so uh, do register it. Strongly advise it. Uh, now we'll move on to um, Aradian Clip to present you a bit more uh, who we hold. So Priyanka and I, we are part of um, Aradian Clip, which is a team, an initiative created uh, in July 2019. Uh, so now we are more than uh, 19 members and we are focusing on diversity. So our main objectives are to raise awareness and break down stereotypes within and outside of AGC. Uh, we also want to provide uh, concrete recommendations for implementation um, in industry and academia and uh, setting an example for AGC. 
Uh, we want to inspire and provide avenues for young people from all horizons. And uh, we, because we want them to join the space sector. And last but not least, uh, we want to enrich the aerospace industry by advocating for diversity and inclusion. So to reach all of these objectives, uh, we have many different activities uh, divided in four main pillars. Uh, so the first one is the long-term projects. Uh, so one long-term project is to support the first women on Mars. Uh, we also want to educate young children and parents with educators. And last but not least, we want to support astronaut selection campaign, which is why we are here tonight, right? Uh, so we also have a couple of activities in communication. Um, and so spoiler alert, uh, next Monday we will have a very cool original content that will be released. So stay tuned uh, for this. Uh, so we have organized an event uh, last year, uh, which was called SG France 2020. It was the kickoff of the RG and Clip initiative, and it was focusing on gender equality and equity. So now I will move on to the next uh, next question of the poll. Uh, it's which gender do you most identify? Because um, so, so far we have been focusing on gender equality and equity. Uh, so this webinar is about why do we need more women astronauts? So we wanted to know uh, who you are and um, who will, yes. Awesome. I see many answers coming. So a great majority of women, uh, but also some men. So it's really nice to see that we have people uh, joining us and not only women. Uh, it's uh, very important to have this discussion all together. Um, at our Clip, we welcome everyone. So while you're still answering, I think I will pass the floor over to you, Priyanka. Right. Thank you so much for presenting about what the SGAC is and the motivation for starting the Our Giant Leap uh, initiative. And last year in September, uh, we managed to host the first kickoff event for this uh, initiative called in, in, in the form of an SD France event, so SD France 2020, during which we had three roundtable discussions. The first one was on tackling gender bias and discrimination. The second one was how to improve mentorship strategies for women. And the third one was, which is very important, filling in the gaps in female-oriented space research. For example, there are just not enough women astronauts, so how do you have enough data on women? And, okay. And some of the select outcomes that I'd like to present to you today are, a, there is still a lot of uh, instance of unconscious bias in this aerospace industry even today. Secondly, there is a big need for visible role models for uh, encouraging young girls to apply through education, through campaigns, and especially through action. And the third one is uh, it differences in astronauts, uh, astronaut data that exists today due to gender. We need to call for investigation into these differences rather than just assuming that there will be differences and therefore male astronauts need to be preferred first. So these are the uh, questions that we are trying to address during these series of webinars. And today we're going to start off with why do we need more women astronauts? And so our main objective for this uh, long-term project within our giant leap is firstly to promote the astronaut career to young girls and qualified women, support the development of research related to women astronauts, and thirdly, increase the number of women applicants to the next astronaut campaigns, be it public or private. And as we know, it's very exciting news. ESA has, select, uh, has announced its selections uh, for the next cohort in 2021, and they'll start receiving applications from 31st of March, so we're just in time with our webinar series to encourage more women to apply to the ESA astronaut selections. And so mark your calendars. Today is the first episode on why do we need more women uh, astronauts. On the 1st of April, we'll provide you with tips to how to prepare your application. And the third episode would be candidate profiles. So we'll be proposing some of the profiles that are suitable astronaut uh, candidates for the ESA selections. 
So before we continue, I'd like to ask a third question to the audience, Clara. Yes, the next question is Nahon. So are you planning to apply to the ESA ASNOT selection? Yes, I see a tons of yes, that's awesome. I'll also answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> and you can only guess what my answer is. <laughs> so that's a lot of people who want to apply to the astronauts. And if you're a woman, I have some news for you. <laughs> so statistics showed. So it it was firstly it was very hard to find statistics that are up to date. But the, this is one source that we found. Uh, the source is given below and. Uh, apparently, it's correct as of uh, 20 in December, uh, October 2020. So since 1961, 556 people have been to space, but less than 11% have really been human. Uh, have been women, sorry. And to break it down uh, according to country, which countries have sent more than one person to space, but and how many of these people that they've sent to space are actually have actually been women. So the UK for now has sent two people, but it's been one man, one woman. Uh, the US has so far achieved about 15%. Um, France has one woman out of 10, uh, Claudine Nere. Uh, Russia has four out of 122. So basically, there just not have been enough women in uh, women astronauts. And when, we come, when it comes to ESA's records, uh, almost 17% women applicants were there during the last call in 2008, but one woman was selected, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti, who's still an active uh, astronaut and is preparing her second mission. And so far in the European Space Agency's record, we have three women who have been part of the European Astronaut Corps, Marianne Merchez, um, Claudine Herre, and Samantha. And if you compare that with NASA, in the last few selections, they've managed almost 50-50% parity. So why is ESA really lagging behind? And it's not even like um, women have not uh, performed well in space. There have been uh, fantastic mo key moments in space, in the history of women in aerospace, for example, Already, there have been women in space. So the first woman in space was Valentina Tereshkova from the USSR. Then um, the most time that is spent that has been spent in space has been an American woman, uh, Peggy Whitson. Uh, they have women have also taken part in long duration uh, missions, uh, spacewalks, and all female EVA has also been performed. So the next questions are: When are we going to first send send the first woman on the moon, and then the first humans and then the first woman on Mars. So the first woman on the moon is apparently being taken care of by the NASA Artemis missions. And this is something which is interesting that came out of SD France last year, where we had invited uh, the president of the French Association of uh, Female Pirates, uh, Christine de Bouzy, who showed us that in the sister um, industry to space, which is aviation, if you look at the history of how uh, women have uh, been dealt in this industry, you'll see several instances of direct or unconscious bias. For example, women have been barred from the, uh, taking part in the military. And once women were starting to be recruited, there were strikes in civil aviation. Although women have also shown a lot of feats, such as solo flights, they've created lots of world records. So the sound barrier has been broken, etc. And this also has had a consequence in space. For example, initially NASA had barred, uh, ha had uh, put the condition that astronauts just be test pilots, but women were barred from being test pilots, so they could not be candidates for the astronaut selection. So keeping that these questions in mind, I would like to invite our speakers to, uh, to the podium. To give a brief introduction, our first speaker, um, Mikhaila Musilova, she is an astrobiologist and she's also the director of the uh, of High Seas uh, Analog Space Station in Hawaii. She studied and conducted research at the California Institute of Technology at University College of London, 
University of Bristol, Sheila University, and the, uh, and the International Space University, among others. She's also worked for NASA, the University of London Observatory, Canada, France, Hawaii Telescope, and was the commander of over 20 simulated missions to the moon and Mars uh, through high seas. In fact, to her knowledge, uh, Michaela has led the largest amount of mixed and all-female analog space mission crews, and she is also a visiting professor at the Slovak University of Technology, a vice chair of SOSA, adjunct faculty at ISU, and the head of research at the space technology company Nidronix. She has received numerous prizes and research grants, including the Emerging Space Leaders Grant from the IAF, Women in Aerospace Europe Young Professional Award, and was also selected as one of the most promising 30 under 30 by Forbes Slovakia. She is also actively involved in the Duke of Edinburgh's international award program as a patron of Slovakia's program and the global program's emerging leaders representative. Furthermore, she, is, she regularly teaches, gives lectures and keynote presentations, works with international media and is a STEM Punk's educational program's advisory board member. She's also written articles for space.com and has co-authored her biography, A Woman from Mars. So over to you, Michaela. Let me just stop sharing my screen. All right, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the, the great introduction. Um, so as I always say, aloha from Hawaii slash the moon as I'm currently on an analog lunar mission uh, hiding inside the lab in the high sea station, uh, a little bit of privacy here from my colleagues uh, on the mission. So let me try and share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see it. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. I'm just trying to find the, there we go, full screen button. Let's see. There we go. Can you see the full screen? Yes. All right. Okay, perfect. All right, well, uh, thank you, Priyanka, for the long introduction. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, yes, I'm the director of the High Sea Station. For those of you that are not familiar, it's the the white dome and adjacent building you can see on the picture here. I will tell you a little bit more about it later. Um, and as Priyanka said, I've done now over 20 analog uh, missions to the moon and Mars. I was commander of uh, the majority of them. It's just a picture of me in the habitat on, on one of those missions. And so briefly about how I got to this in the first place. So let's hope my slides will work. Uh, there we go. Well, part of it was actually um, a dream from childhood. When I was eight years old, uh, I discovered what astronauts are. I even had uh, the privilege of meeting the first Slovak cosmonaut, Ivan Bela. Uh, I'm from Slovakia, by the way. And the last man to walk on the moon, uh, Jean Cernan, who has Czech and Slovak um, heritage. And I remember not only being amazed by these gentlemen and uh, really wanting to do a similar job as, uh, as they do, but also realizing that there are very few women astronauts out there. And even at that age, uh, I was like, well, you know, I think women should be you know, capable of doing such work too. Why aren't there more women? And it became my own personal goal to almost prove that women you know, are capable enough to join the astronaut corps. And uh, as a side note, Actually, I cannot currently apply for the East astronaut selection because I'm from Slovakia and Slovakia is not yet an associate or full member ESA state. So I'm still trying to find my path towards this. So it's a very difficult dream to have, but I am determined to try my best throughout my life and hopefully one day it will happen. Um, but it did start sort of this way as admiration, but also almost like a challenge that I wanted to take on. And uh, eventually uh, I also, oh, sorry. Slides seem to be jumping. Uh, here we go. Uh, I also decided to focus on astrobiology as my um, expertise in research. And that is essentially multidisciplinary science, trying to find life in space, but also understand how it uh, came to be on Earth. It's a combination of geology, astrophysics, and different uh, biological sciences. And so you can see some different pictures of me uh, doing some astrobiology research during my very first analog mission at the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. Uh, also doing a lot of geology field work and, and astronomy, as Priyanka mentioned in my biography. 
And to do that, yeah, I studied at different universities abroad, always applying for scholarships, internships, whatever opportunities I had. I self-funded all my studies. It was a very difficult time because I had to have uh, sometimes three jobs at one time to try and uh, help finance my studies. I was fortunate that I received a number of scholarships and, and help even from charities to do my studies. Uh, everything just so that I could uh, continue forward towards my dream. And uh, so here's also just a quick snapshot of some of my other activities. I, I uh, worked for NASA JPL in the planetary protection section. So we're trying to, uh, as much as we want to look for life elsewhere in space, we also want to make sure we don't contaminate it all with, with our terrestrial microbes, microbes from Earth. And uh, therefore, us astrobiologists, one day if we find life on Mars, we won't even know if it maybe originated from Earth in the first place. Um, my research has taken me to a lot of extreme environments, for instance, in the Arctic. You can see a picture of me in the bottom left in uh, Greenland doing research. Uh, also got grants to do work in Japan. Uh, I love traveling. I love getting to know people from cultures all around the world. So you can see me in the middle picture in a, in a beautiful kimono that I was uh, fortunate to wear. And I also came back home to my home country, Slovakia, where I eventually became the chair of the Slovak Organization for Space Activities. On the picture in the top right, you can see me with the first Slovak satellite, SK cube right behind me in a clean room. And, uh, and to this day, I'm a visiting professor at a Slovak University of Technology. And finally, I'm uh, also adjunct faculty at the International Space University and have many other consulting jobs, such as I'm the head of research of a space technology company called Nedronics. Um, so that's kind of about me in a nutshell. Um, and so for today's topic, I would like to First, start with a quick introduction of high seas. Again, for those of you who may not be familiar or even what analog missions are like. So it's the station you can see in the picture here. It's located on the volcano Mauna Loa, approximately two and a half thousand meters high up on this volcano. As you can see from the picture, the terrain around the habitat is very, uh, there's basically no vegetation. It's, it's all volcanic. It really looks almost like an alien landscape. And uh, the analog astronauts live inside this dome during the missions. They can only go outside on EVAs or spacewalks or wearing analog suits. And we try to make uh, the simulation as realistic as possible so people really get the experience of actually being on the moon or Mars and learn a lot of important lessons from that, but also get to do all sorts of exciting research. Here's what the inside, oh, sorry, okay. it's jumping for some reason. Um, this is what the inside of the habitat looks like. Uh, it's approximately 12 meters in diameter. You can see this is from a recent mission here at high seas, actually around Christmas time. You can see one of our uh, Christmas tree. It's, it's actually a hydroponic um, greenhouse in the back. You can see we decorated kind of like a uh, Christmas tree. This main area is a multifunctional room, everything from an office to an exercise area. You can even see a treadmill and a bicycle in the background. And then each of us gets a tiny little bedroom. You can see in the top right picture, there's me for scale. Uh, back when I was meant to be here on an eight month mission. And so I had a lot of things and it was a very crowded space. Um, and uh, this is to give you an idea of the different types of research we do. So there's a lot of exploration, trying to find these different lava tubes, so lava caves, and understand what kind of life forms can exist inside. For instance, I currently have an ongoing collaboration with NASA Goddard, where we're looking at extreme life forms that live in the lava tubes as uh, something that could potentially exist on Mars today. If you look at the top left picture, that's me for scale standing above an entrance to uh, one of these lava tubes, lava caves uh, in the bottom left picture. There's a colleague on mission in an analog spacesuit exploring one of those tubes. You can see it's a pretty difficult environment to be in in the bottom right. I think that might even be Priyanka on the picture inside a lava cave uh, on a mission. And it, they've also been studied by space architects. As you can see, some of them are pretty spacious. So there's their ideas of actually building habitats inside these lava caves where it would protect, uh, provide natural protection from radiation and other hazards on the surface of the moon and Mars. And in the top uh, right picture, you can see me with uh, one of the many rovers we've tested on missions. So we also do a lot of technology testing during our, our analog missions. And uh, another thing that's very close to my heart is to do a lot of education and outreach. 
these are some examples of a mission to Mars competition I lead in Slovakia, which is for high school students to design an experiment that's relevant to uh, missions to the moon and Mars. And then the winning experiment I bring on mission with me and perform it with the crew. So you can just see some different examples there. And in the bottom right picture, I'm holding hair and some interesting dark liquid that's actually dissolved hair that Slovakian high school students um, suggested we use as fertilizer for different plants and actually has been working really well and we're running this experiment currently. But you can see a lot of young ladies in these pictures. And that's not just because I wanted to show pictures of you know young female students doing work. Actually, the majority of uh, people in the last uh, couple rounds of this competition we've uh, run in Slovakia have been young uh, ladies. And I think part of it was because I was running the, this competition. Uh, I do a lot of outreach and educational work in Slovakia. And I think they kind of needed to see a female scientist, uh, a female astronaut hopeful doing this kind of work to inspire them to even apply to a kind of STEM-based uh, competition. And in a similar way in Hawaii, we run in collaboration with uh, the organization Pisces a similar kind of program to encourage particularly young ladies to take part in STEM activities and they get to actually even come to the high seas facility, spend the night here, do some geology work with me and uh, colleagues in, in the space sector. Um, and we're noticing that it's just really important for young women to have female role models to look, uh, look up to and encourage them to see that, oh, it's possible to do these activities too. And you know, for some, it may be they may see it as a challenge, like I did as an eight-year-old, like oh, they're you know mostly male astronauts, where are the women? But for others, if they don't see a role model, it might discourage them to apply. And in a similar way, since I've been the director of High Seas, um, apart, yeah, still continuing to work with the media. Here, are just some more examples of different uh, projects we've worked on, including a documentary called Space Drop. Uh, I've been trying to show that you know women are equally competent and capable of, of being part of analog missions, being commanders of missions, and can achieve great things too. And I, and over time, I've been very, very happy that I've had a lot of women apply. Actually, over the last two years, majority of applicants for analog missions have been women, and most of my crews have been female-dominated. Again, it wasn't. Uh, positive discrimination. I wasn't preferentially choosing them. I just had a big amount of women apply and they were very qualified and had amazing research projects. Here are uh, some examples uh, of different missions I've been on. You can see it's a variety of, I've had missions where there was only one man on the crew and the rest were women. Um, there was also a mission where I was the only female on the crew and the rest were men. Uh, all female missions you can see in the bottom right picture and the the le bottom left picture, you can actually see me. I was commander of two crews. Uh, the crew on the right is the kind of outgoing crew. The crew on the left is the incoming one. Priyanka is uh, there in the picture uh, next to me. And uh, again, you know, I I've been able to work with a variety of um, crews and women every time, you know, did a great job. Uh, I must say the the all-female crew you see in the bottom right picture, they had to deal with a huge amount of challenges, including very bad weather. So they were stuck indoors for, for days on end. We had low power and so many other problems and they dealt with it extremely well or some of the biggest, as we say in American English, troopers uh, to put up with all the challenges and not get depressed, not get put off through all of this. So. Uh, all I can say, I've, I've had great experiences with mixed crews, all female, um, and I, it seems that the more other women see women do these analog missions, the more they want to apply, and that's been my goal uh, as director of high seas is to make this facility be more open and encouraging to women, to people of color, and essentially just to show that if you really want to achieve something you can, all you have to do is try. So thank you very much for your attention. Here are my contact details. If you would like to get in touch or be involved in the missions, uh, please, please don't hesitate to do so. And I'll, I'll hand over uh, the word now to my colleagues. Perfect, Michaela. That, that really answered a lot of questions that we already had from the audience, uh, including you know, why analog missions are important, and especially the the fact that we need role models to see, to be able to apply to these missions. 
So uh, moving on to our next speaker, we have with us Professor Virginia Watering, and she has been using her training in bio biochemistry uh, with a, a bachelor in science from Florida State University in physiology and pharmacology, a PhD from St. Louis University in USA, to study the actions of medications used during spaceflight missions. This means first studying the effects of the spaceflight environment in physiology and then turning to potential spaceflight induced changes in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Virginia has been doing this during positions at Johnson Space Center and Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and now at the International Space University in Strasbourg. She has held management positions in the past, most recently as deputy director and chief scientist of the NASA-funded Translational Research Institute for Space Health. However, she prefers doing science to managing it. Her current research ranges from the study of women's health during spaceflight missions to, exam uh, to examination of biochemical responses to Earth analogs of space in simple model organisms. So over to you. Uh, Virginia. I think you're muted, Virginia. Um, Virginia, I think you're still muted. Yes, I can hear you, Virginia. Um, well, it was working earlier, so it should be working. Can you try again? Can you hear me now? I just switched headphones. Yes. Oh yes, okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay, good, good. Always have that hardware, right? These are the kinds of lessons we learn in space that uh, pay off in all kinds of realms. So thank you for the kind introduction and apologies for the technical issue, but we'll, we'll carry on. So I'd like to talk to you today about how I think space has room for all kinds of people, lots of kinds of people. Um, we, you, you mentioned a few things uh, about who I am. Uh, my education is there and I'd like to point out I uh, began unlike, um, unlike our previous speaker, I, I did not have a childhood dream of being involved in space, but rather I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, so, so that's what I did. I trained to be a, a pharmacologist and physiologist. I studied how brain cells worked, how ion channels worked. And at the end of my training, I was applying for jobs to be a professor. I thought I would be a, a very dull professor in an ordinary university studying, you know, a couple of molecules in the brain someplace. But Johnson Space Center was advertising for someone who had training like mine. And I thought it was really weird that NASA might want someone with training like me. Um, but I mean, how could you not apply? So I applied. And to my great surprise, they hired me. So there's a lesson for you. Always apply for the job and just see what happens. So they hired me and I went to Johnson Space Center and then I had to learn about space. I had to learn what happens to the body when it's in space and then think about, yeah, what I study. How do drugs work in a body that has adapted to being in space? And that has been quite a journey. It took me to places I didn't think I would go. And I'll show you here a few of the, the papers that I've published along the way and a little book. Um, so looking at absolutely every aspect of medications in space from how well the individual pills last in the spaceflight environment to um, how medicines get used to 
specific questions regarding certain kinds of, of astronauts. So, so the um, study I did, the work I've done in women's health came directly out of questions that uh, some of the flight surgeons asked me about how to treat their patients. So that was, that was fascinating and completely unexpected. Now, we've already talked a little bit about how astronauts um, have come a long way, right? So the, the very first astronauts were not diverse in any sense. You can barely tell these guys apart from each other, right? Um, and they were all guys, and they weren't just guys. They were, they were in the military, and they were test pilots. And in fact, that was one of the criteria for even being considered to be an astronaut. You had to be a military test pilot. And women were not military in those days, so women were not included. If you ever get a chance to go to Cleveland, Ohio, there's a very small little museum there, the International Women's Air and Space Museum, that has a lot of material about uh, women in space. And I, I encourage you to go look at that. It's, it's well worth the trip. And this is a different version of some of the, the graphs that our, our first speaker had. This version is, is produced by one of my interns, Olivia Sue, who is now at Embry-Riddle. Um, there haven't been very many women in space, right? Depending on how you count it, we're, we're up to about 14% now. Um, historically, it was, it was a lot lower. The U.S., uh, you know, NASA is, is doing much, much closer to parity when it comes to women in the astronaut corps. Other countries are, are lagging a bit behind. But we are seeing, um, I think, a general turning of the tide when it comes to this. We're also, um, so not only have we been missing out on women in spaceflight missions, we're missing out on long duration data. Uh, when it comes to, to uh, human subject data in, in missions. So this, this particular chart shows you that a very tiny fraction of missions have collected data on female subjects. These are days across the x-axis, days in mission. So we have, we have some shorter missions that were um, early days in the ISS, Around 200-ish days is typical for an ISS mission now. And you see a kind of a peak in, the, in this area. And a few women are, are represented, in, are represented in, in that cohort. There are a few individuals who are a little bit longer. And this is an older graph from my, my friend John Charles from NASA. Um, now we have a couple data points out in one year. None of those are, are women yet, though, but we're getting closer. Now, nearly everybody who studies physiology in spaceflight shows a chart like this. It's really kind of a, a famous chart. Nearly every physiological system we look at, we have seen that something changes when people are in space. Something or another changes. And if you note, a lot of these curves show, uh, this time scale is on months now on the x-axis. A lot of these changes occur relatively quickly and then they settle down to uh, what we usually call a space normal. It's not quite the same as before flight, but it's also far removed from any area of clinical concern. There are some ex uh, exceptions though, uh, bone and calcium metabolism never return back down to baseline and similarly effects of radiation continue to, to accumulate. We have that collection of data and every 10 years or so NASA gets reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences and in 2010 the report included a few mentions of how little we know about what happens with women in spaceflight. They, they pulled out a few things about the reproductive system, effects of radiation on women's health. We don't know what's going on with, with various hormones. Uh, we have concerns about suit design to accommodate uh, smaller individuals, and that's certainly became an issue recently. We also don't know much about um, 
mixes of, of people on teams in, in the space flight environment or uh, certain other psychological kinds of questions. And this report is available for free. You can go download it yourself. And NASA took this advice and they started trying to collect more data on women, um, but not just human women. So, so a lot of experiments that are done to try and understand physiology and spaceflight are performed on animals or cell cultures. So NASA also asked that researchers include animals that were both male and female in their animal experiments and cells from females as well in cell experiments. So as uh, those efforts continued, the numbers got a little bit higher, a little bit better. This is, this is four years later. We have a few more females in the cohorts. Uh, missions are getting a tiny bit longer, not much. Things continue to improve. Um, this journal, the Journal of Women's Health, published quite a few papers. There was a series of papers on this particular issue in 2014 on uh, papers that came out as a result of that decadal review of NASA's human research program. If you're interested in this topic, that's a, that's a really cool place to do some reading. There's, there are separate chapters on the cardiovascular system, the immune system, all the separate physiology systems that go into this kind of chart. Nonetheless, these data are for mostly male subjects. So on any particular mission where an experiment was happening, it might have been all male or it might have been mostly male and one woman. This meant that there were never enough women in the studies to study their data separately. So we really don't know what, uh, what these curves would look like for women. Um, we don't know if they would be the same for women or if they would be any different for women. We just don't know. And those of you who have a medical background probably realize that we, we now perform medicine, we practice medicine in an evidence-based kind of fashion. We don't like to assume, we don't like to extrapolate, we don't like to guess. We like to know that a particular therapeutic strategy or protocol will work for the patients that, that it's being given. So we need to know if these curves are the same for female subjects or if they're different. And similarly, there are a few curves that are left off of here. We don't know what happens to the reproductive system. It hasn't been studied. We also don't know what happens in my area with pharmacology. Um, that, that's not on here. We don't know um, we don't have a very good picture yet for what happens with individual psychology or with team psychology, which are hugely important if we're thinking about uh, going on exploration kinds of missions. And we don't know what happens if we extend this for a longer duration. Right now, most of our data stops at around six months. It doesn't go much beyond that. What happens for longer? We don't know if, if the uh, bone and calcium metabolism issue continues in a linear fashion, or you know, perhaps it does curve at some point, or perhaps it curves the other way and gets worse at some point. We just don't know. And that not knowing is a, is a huge problem when it comes to uh, designing potential medical treatments or countermeasures to help our crew members in these uh, space flight missions. So that's the end of what I have to show you. I think that uh, we have some questions to answer now, right? Yes, thank you so much for that really insightful presentation. It shows that there is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of scope for research to be done on women and that we just lack a lot of women astronauts, which is sort of stopping us from getting that data. So to both the presenters, can we have you on camera, please? So, and so now we, let's move on to the yeah. round table session. Hello? Yeah. So both to just quickly summarize your uh, presentations to the audience. So Michaela talked about how analog missions have shown that crew cohesion um, is helped by having more women on board. 
And uh, all women missions have also been very successful uh, back here on Earth. And even on the ISS, for example, we've had an all-female EVA done already. And according to P Professor Virginia Wotring, there is still a lot of research that is a lack uh, that we're lacking and uh, on humans uh, and women especially and it sort of is a big motivator for pushing for more women astronauts by all agencies not just nasa or isa and so the first question that i'd like to pose the two of you uh, is why why do we need to send women astronauts and how does that um, how is that beneficial for people here on earth you know what what does society gain from sending women uh, to the ISS, to the moon, maybe tomorrow to Mars. So maybe uh, Virginia, if you like to answer it. Sure, so I, I think there are, are a few reasons. Um, one is that um, women participate in every segment of society, in, including um, space exploration. And that's that, We're, we do these things now. Um, another reason is, is inspirational. You know, there is, there is nothing uh, really more appealing to a kid than an astronaut. And we know, we know because we are, we are women and we've, we've looked at older women doing cool things when, when we were little girls, there's nothing more uh, motivating than seeing uh, a successful woman doing something really cool. You know, so that's, I can't think better inspiration than that. Michaela, what do you have to, to add to that? I mean, honestly, I, I completely agree. I think my answer, my first response would be, I mean, why not? <laughs> why can't women be astronaut? Why shouldn't there be more? I mean, yeah. I think this is just part of the bias in our society where women still, for some reason doubt themselves that they can't do the same work as, as men and of course you know there are some jobs where maybe you know it's physically advantageous to be a man but not you know all men are stronger than women and so on and so forth but the most important thing is just not to doubt oneself and that's where as you were saying virginia the having the role models is so extremely important because if women don't see more women or other women doing certain jobs, they think that it's impossible and so many are put off. And that's why if now we can get more and more women applying and hopefully being selected uh, to be astronauts and you know, continue being part of the space industry and basically any other sector in the world, uh, that will hopefully encourage other women to stop doubting this, themselves, to even ask this question of, you know, if I can even do this. And then that will hopefully increase, you know, the amount of women applying and women selected, uh, and that will slowly get rid of this societal bias, but also this this big gap that currently exists. Okay, thank you for those answers. So, Professor Watering, you mentioned that we don't know much about women research in space, and uh, it's a question for both of you. But you, especially from the medical point of view, can we rely on analog missions to close this? So sort of close this gap in data in gender? I think analog well, mission. Um, <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to just fill me in. I mean, you know, from experience, analog missions are a great start for a lot of people. Um, many people have aspirations to be astronauts, but sometimes they, they just want to do research in the space sector or something relevant or, or do outreach. And but they again have all these doubts. They they don't see enough role models and so on and so forth. But if they can at least get onto an analog mission, experience what it's like, and hopefully they have a good experience, that will encourage them to be more involved. And more women will see that women are doing analog missions, and and again that will have a kind of uh, a chain effect there. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, during uh, astronaut applications for, for real space missions, they look at your relevant experience, you know, not just your education, things like that. And if you have, 
examples of or experience being part of analog missions and working in extreme conditions with other people as a team player or leader and so on that is also very beneficial to to your application so it's a combination of things of um, women being more involved in this will help encourage more women but also give them the relevant experience which will hopefully make them more uh, qualified candidates when applying for actual missions yeah thank you so analogs can can help us uh tremendously they they enable us to do more experiments on earth it's easier it's cheaper everything about it is more accessible and and we we try to collect all the data we possibly can from the analog situations sometimes we then have to follow up experiments in flight just to make sure that things are the same there and there are some um, aspects of the space flight environment where we don't have a very good analog on earth uh, radiation exposure is one of those microgravity itself is is one of those those are uh, we have some we have some ways to uh, kind of fake it for uh, a few physiological systems, but we don't have an ideal analog for that. So uh, the the answer is that we do everything we possibly can to collect the data that we need. So to just go on to that uh, about analogs being a very good test bed. In space itself, like how can we? Uh, so we've had several instances of things going wrong in the ISS just because people are not prepared to deal with women astronauts. For example, the recent EVA uh, issue that happened, uh, the EVA suit not being of the right size, or uh, something very amusing about, I think it was Sally Ride when she wanted some tampons and they said, How many do you need? Would 100 be enough? So. There are many of for us it's amusing but it also shows that in general women are people are just not aware of issues that women might face in these environments so how do you think the space environment can be made a bit more comfortable like is there something that can be improved on the iss what new considerations do you think should be made for the lunar gateway or even for future mars or lunar habitats all you need to do is put more women there <laughs> for a start yeah You know, obviously, you know, here we don't do uh, that kind of analog. As Virginia said, there's there's limitations to what we can simulate on Earth. But just simply, uh, you know, looking at uh, different experiences from analog missions here, yeah, there's still, yeah, there's still just even you know, comfort-wise, that we need to change for women. For instance, even at this facility, we have um, these two compost toilets but they're not made to, how to put this, uh, receive too much liquid when you do your business. And so actually all analog astronauts have to use the urinal, but it's made for men to use. And so women have to either use a shiwi or go in all sorts of crazy positions to you know, be able to go to the bathroom, something we have to do every single day, multiple times a day. And so even you know, from that perspective, it, there's little things like that that people just don't think of or consider because they don't normally have data from women. But now with all these missions we've been running, you know, I've been able to collect all this information, how to improve this, how to make things better. And um, you know, on the ISS and for future space missions, without being able to collect feedback from women to improve all these things, even the little things that we don't think of, like you mentioned, the tampons or whatever, uh, you know, we're not able to make um, the experience for women better. So part of it is, uh, yes, you know, simulating things, training as much on Earth, but then just getting more and more women into space, getting the data, you know, Virginia was saying that we're still really missing and getting the feedback on how to make things better. Okay. I'm so glad yes. you brought up the toilet. Um, <laughs> so, so on the space station, uh, menstruating women have, were previously directed to to um, divert their urine into waste rather than running it through the water recycling system. You know, right now the water recycling system lets us reuse uh, a tremendous amount of the water that would otherwise be thrown away. But the the original designs of the toilet on the U.S. side 
um, didn't uh, engineer in a coping mechanism for some contaminating blood. Now, just a, a couple of weeks ago, a new toilet system got sent up and it has been made to address this issue. So we don't have to waste that water now. So we are, we are making strides. But it took, what, 20 years before people decided it's necessary <laughs> to have that design? So this is a question. Oh, about... I'm, I'm with you, but you know, I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> so speaking about these uh, instances, if the ISS itself has, you know, work needs to be done on to make the environment more suitable for women, etc. And there is also like this general lack of diversity in this uh, in the astronaut crews. So, do you think we as a society are really ready to have a sustainable society in space, like even for short duration on the moon or on those the six months journey to Mars, and then probably years of uh, uh, staying on Mars as a team? So. Oh. I'll just go quickly. Um, I mean, yes, you know, there, definitely we should have such goals in mind. We should aim for such things. And having more and more women involved in these projects and hopefully on those missions will, I think, overall make uh, society better on Earth too. You know, like we were discussing, uh, one thing, the role models, but also, you know, showing that women can be so competent, capable of being part of these missions will hopefully reduce a lot of the bias that currently exists that you know women are not good enough to do these and that which unfortunately is still present um, in different parts of academia industry and so on uh, and you know many times it's not that oh, not enough women apply or too many women are discouraged but they also face you know certain glass ceilings and hurdles that are currently kind of you know still unspoken of or not spoken of about enough and so again having these big goals that include women, women are key parts of it, I'm hoping will gradually help break, you know, through a lot of these different problems that uh, are still existing. I think the data that are coming out of analogs like yours and out of Antarctic missions are showing really clearly and powerfully that uh, mixed gender teams perform better than single gender teams. And I think that fact has been noted by space agencies. And that, that really helps support the notion that, that we all do need to work together on big projects like this. We, it, it doesn't serve anyone to be exclusionary. So um, as I had promised, to the audience earlier. We would be opening the round of questions. But before we do that, I have one final question that we had prepared on the ESA selections that are coming up. And it's it's kind of a question with uh, two separate uh, subparts to it. Firstly, what do you think would be the benefits to ESA and to the European nations to have more women astronauts? And also on their reserved call, like instead of having the four or five main astronauts, they plan to have proposed 20 uh, astronauts in the reserved call. Do you think that would um, lead to better diversity and background, gender or nationalities of the astronauts that they are selected? Yeah. <laughs> so, when it comes to selecting uh, an astronaut core that's relatively large, that that might help um, in an inclusive kind of a, a notion. But at the same time, right now, we don't have the capability to fly very many people very often. So some of those people you select are going to be hanging out on Earth for a long, long time before they get a chance to go on a mission. And that might not feel very good. So I don't know what the right answer there is to have a, a big core that is, is somewhat Earthbound versus a smaller core. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think I'll just add that, you know, again, in terms of the diversity, as we were you know, talking about until now, 
to be more inclusive is going to send a very strong message um, and it's important to uh, hold on to the data or stick to the data that you know, has been collected like Virginia mentioned from the different analog emissions and other extreme environments. Mixed crews have been performing really well so why don't we actually try and implement that and really in the astronaut core and ESA were to take this route that would be a great example and again hopefully a great way to change things for the future for the better. So thank you for this uh, short roundtable session. And now I'd like to quickly um, tell the audience that do mark your calendars. We do have two other webinars. The first one will be on, on tips to prepare your application for the ESA selections. The second one is uh, candidate profiles. We'll be talking about certain some of the women who are good candidates for the next selections. And I believe we have one question from Clara to get to know the audience a bit better before we open the round of questions for from the audience. Yes, I'm launching the question now. Um, so we were wondering which field are you currently working, studying in? Because uh, we do know that lots of people um, are coming from aerospace but uh, it's not a requirement to be an astronaut. So you could be a, a doctor, you could be a geologist. Um, so we were really curious about you, your background. So I see a lot of space engineering, aerospace, uh, physics as well, outreach, space medicine, awesome, mechanical engineer, education, chemical engineering. High school, great, awesome. So we have a lot of uh, different background. Uh, that's really great. Of course, uh, some of you and the majority, I will say, are uh, space engineers, uh, but not only. So that's really great news to see a, a great diversity in the audience. I think we can move on to the question and answer session. Okay, so thank you, Clara. And wow, we do have a lot of questions. I'll have to choose. <laughs> so firstly, um, uh, to, uh, to Michaela, someone wants to know, let's start with this question. How can we be exposed to good opportunities such as at high seas? How do you apply? Well, actually, uh, it, you know, as I mentioned before, it was, it's been my goal to open up this facility to you know, people from all over the world and different disciplines and, and you know, uh, all genders are welcome. So uh, nowadays you just go to our website and there's information on how to apply to be part of a high seas mission. Of course, we have some requirements and we, you know, want you to come here for the right reasons to do research and outreach that's going to benefit humanity and help with future space exploration. So not just to come here and take selfies in space suits, but if you're, you know, apply for the right reasons. Um, I'm happy to consider you know, applications from people of all walks of life and different areas of expertise. And uh, in the last year, yeah, we've, we've had very, very diverse crews from that uh, point of view. So please feel free to. And there are other analogs around the world. You just have to look into that. They have different um, policies of who they accept on mission and so on. Um, but it's a great experience if you want to get your foot in the door in the space sector. So I highly recommend you, you give it a try. Thank you for that answer. My next question is to Virginia. Uh, the question is, why do you could you tell us a bit more about how NASA might have worked on reaching parity in its astronaut core in the recent selections, at least? Oh my goodness, I have no idea. Um, I, I doubt that they made any special effort. I, I suspect that a lot more women have been applying. You know, um, in, in in the students that I teach, we're seeing more and more women all the time. I, I think this is this is just gradually happening, and it's fabulous. So the next question is um, to Michaela. 
So although now you have a lot of women applying for analog visions, as has always been the case, is an older data used from analog mostly collected with mail crews? And um, yeah, is there like an effort being done to update all this data? I mean, I can, you know, only talk about the data I have access to, so you know, can't speak for other analogs. Uh, for here uh, at High Seas, I can tell you from my experience, uh, it used to be more male dominated in terms of just applications. Uh, the crews on general have been pretty 50-50 in terms of men and women, though overall there was always slightly more male crew members. Um, but uh, since I've been running the missions, gradually more and more women have been applying statistically. And now, because I have so many great female uh, applicants, um, I end up having actually majority female crew. So it tends to be like two male crew members, four female crew members, uh, or you know, all female missions like that, like we talked about before. The next question is to uh, Virginia. So Professor Wotring, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, this person wants to know, what would be the path to take space medicine? She's currently, she or he or she is currently a medical intern in the Philippines and is planning to take up space medicine as her field of specialization. That's wonderful. So there are space medicine internships that you could do at the, the stage that you are now. There are a few of them um, that I'm aware of in, in the States, the UK, and uh, South America. There are probably some in Europe too, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there are also space medicine residency programs that you can get into. So there are, there are ways to do this. Um, there and, and that's just when it comes to formal education. You can also become a specialist in remote medicine or wilderness medicine, it's sometimes called. That kind of training is, is really advantageous when it comes to being a flight surgeon. There's also military pathways. Um, the field of space medicine grew out of aerospace medicine. Uh, that was based on, on taking care of people who fly planes in the military. So most of the militaries around the world have an avenue to get into this. There's lots of ways, lots of different approaches. Oops, sorry, I was muted. So for the next uh, question, it's... Um, so. Could Professor Watering also tell us about bed rest studies? Are women represented enough or are there opportunities? How can we apply? So there are bed rest studies going on out there. The one I'm most familiar with right now is run in Germany in the NVHAB situation. Uh, women absolutely are recruited into these situations. And I think that uh, gender parity is, is pretty common in, in bed rest scenarios. Um, there, the biggest difficulty finding people to be in bed rest is, is finding subjects that we consider to be astronaut-like, who are willing to lie down for you know, three weeks or six weeks or whatever it is. Most of the subjects who, that we think of as astronaut-like are, are relatively fit and active and want to do anything other than just lie down in bed. The next question, question for, for Michaela. So are you studying, are you formally studying the impact of gender ratio during these missions on the successfulness of the mission or on the mood and social aspects? Like, are you giving out, are you writing research papers? No, um, currently not. We're we're you know we're keeping statistical information on things, um, but we don't have a formal study going on at the moment anyway. Um, but it's definitely something that's been a lot of uh, of a lot of interest, and we have some more complex coming up here at High Seas in the near future, which we'll be looking into that uh, aspect as well of uh, the dynamics and focusing on the gender part too. So for now, I can just go from let's say 
more qualitative data and quantitative in terms of numbers and, and certain research results. Uh, next to Virginia, it's it's an interesting question. It's uh, from your talk. Do we understand correctly that basically our women astronauts are jumping into the complete unknown when going to space? Does the earthly everyday gender data gap in medicine also impact this? So well, that's that's an interesting way to to think about it. Um, I think I think it's not quite as dramatic as as you make it sound. We know from experience with human beings in general that that there are risks associated with going to space, but we have figured out how to mitigate a lot of them. Really, the, the launch and the landing are the most significant risks, and that has nothing to do with anyone's gender. Um, women are are facing some some new special challenges when they go to space, but uh, probably in more minor categories. And to kind of put it in perspective, um, so I, I did a I did a paper looking at biomedical data from the Mercury astronauts. And when an astronaut first drank water on a in microgravity, that was the first. They didn't know how well that was going to work. And then John Glenn was the first one to eat food. He swallowed food and everything about his digestion was fine. And But the, the flight surgeons before then, they weren't sure. Um, you know, you just have to try things sometimes. There is a certain amount of personal risk that every astronaut accepts. Mm, so this is one of the more uncomfortable questions. What do you think about pushing for more women astronauts, which is basically uh, leading to positive discrimination? Uh, just like NASA, do you think Europe should also aim for a 50-50 astronaut core uh, by design? I mean, personally, I, I'm never a fan of discrimination of any sort, even positive, though, you know, sometimes it, it may be necessary. I think you know, if you, the most important thing is to make sure you check the regulations, the committees, make sure there are no biases there, people are going to be as fair as possible. So, you know, put all those things in place and then, you know, encourage women like you're doing now through, through this uh, webinar and many other activities to apply. And then it really should be the best, you know, candidates that get selected. So if we, you know, can try and ensure to the best possible degree that during the selection process they will be fair and people will be really chosen for being the best scientists, engineers, doctors, and so on um, when applying to be astronauts, then we won't have to have any kind of positive discrimination because just the top people in their field will be there. So I think it's more about the process of making sure there won't be discrimination along the way and again just encouraging more women to apply and making them realize that, you know, they're perfectly capable of doing it um, and that it's worth a try but that's my personal opinion so i think that was really well said and, and i absolutely agree um i i am extremely uncomfortable with quotas myself i think um if we if we choose a good mix of skills and talents in crew members then we're likely to have a good mix of different kinds of people and, and it all takes care of itself. So that's, it's, it's a very valid point which both of you brought out. And the next question is for Michaela, which is, do you think the difference in women and men makeup of these training or real missions is because does a time lag between these women becoming experienced enough to go on missions? Or is there some other bottleneck where there are more than enough women who are trained to go on these missions but just aren't getting selected? Um, I mean, in the past, there would have been a lag, you know, as you said yourself, uh, women couldn't apply to be test pilots, they couldn't do certain things. Um, from personal experience, um, without going into detail, I have been denied being part of various expeditions and things like that, that I was, I personally believe 
qualified for with my experience and knowledge and whatever and you know i found out that they chose a, a male person to do um that go on that particular expedition or whatever even though they were say less qualified than me uh, just because of some kind of bias that you know as a woman i won't be able to manage under those extreme conditions or whatever so unfortunately you know i think to this day there's still this kind of bias and prejudice that hinders um a lot of women for being selected for certain things and doing things like that so there's a, that kind of lag which i'm hoping with time you know will disappear when there will be less di discrimination in the selection process for, for different activities um and and the other thing I think is is like we've been talking about today is just for a lot of women they didn't see other women be selected and maybe the only women they saw were people that they couldn't really identify with. So now if we have more women from other parts of the space sector, so you know perhaps more artists and science communicators and so on be there, that may make other women realize, oh yeah, I don't have to be just a fighter pilot or whatever to become an astronaut or even analog astronaut. So I think it's having to overcome those two things that will help uh, have more women apply, be even analog astronauts, get those experiences, get rid of any lag that there might be. But I think nowadays there really shouldn't be such a lag or, or minimal, and it's these other things that hinder more women from applying and being selected. Thanks. Um, so just to the audience and to our speakers, we are about 10 minutes away from the end of the webinar. Uh, the master class. Um, so we'll entertain a few more questions. Uh, Michaela, she is speaking to us from a moon mission, and Virginia has been having an extremely long day. But I would really like to thank both of you in advance <laughs> for having made it to to this uh, master class. So moving on to the next question addressed to both of you, and I think it's a very pertinent question and. Um, a lot of men have also asked this to women who dare to have these dreams, let's just say, which is many women struggle to be wives, a mother, and having a career at the same time. How can a woman astronaut conciliate her job with her personal life? Do you think this can hold many women from applying? Maybe Virginia, I'll, I'll complete afterwards. Okay, so I... Having, having worked at Johnson Space Center, I, I had astronauts as my, my coworkers and my neighbors. We lived in the same neighborhoods. Um, I saw a number of astronauts raise families, have kids raise families, men and women. It may be sometimes challenging and inconvenient to, to have kids and balance uh, a challenging career. But women do this in all kinds of challenging careers. Um, it, it doesn't have to stop you at all. No. Our, our uh, female astronaut friends have, have fabulous families. Don't let, don't, don't think otherwise. Thank you. I, I, I'll just add that um, I, I completely agree. Yeah, definitely. You know, it, it is possible and perhaps it should be talked about more. So people don't have this kind of, um, you know, they, they don't make assumptions that, oh, because you're an astronaut, you can't have a family, you can't do this, you can't do that. And the other part of it is um, that it's also about the structures the different institutions put in place to make it be a more family-friendly environment. And there's so many companies and organizations around the world which, um, do make it be very difficult for people to go on maternity and paternity leave and uh, to be able to raise a child while they work. And, you know, and we're not talking just aerospace, you know, any industry in the world has these problems. So it's also up to the different organizations to really think about, okay, what can we do to not make women feel like they have to give up on you know managerial positions and applying to be astronauts whatever it is uh, because we just won't allow them to take that time to be with their family and that's where also again um, to avoid having to do positive discrimination or something like that make people be allowed to do both the paternity and maternity leave and that way you know both parents can be helping out um, so it's even things like that that uh, have to be considered and i think if 
say ESA, other space organizations uh, consider that, and, and maybe they already do, and I don't know about it or, or enough, um, that will really help uh, women not be put off from applying. And so it's just something, a topic that needs to be discussed more, and uh, perhaps that will help overcome such barriers too. They're extremely valid points, uh, so thank you for answering this question. It's it's a bit um, uncomfortable, I would say. Um, so in the next six minutes, we can ask maybe two or three more questions. So uh, for uh, Virginia, are there any links in research on space medicine and long-term effects on both mental and physical health that we derive from confinement missions with high mountaineering expeditions uh, and the like, or do you think there could be any lessons from such expeditions to be applicable into space uh, missions? Oh, absolutely. So those kinds of challenging expeditions are already used as, as analog situations that, that get used uh, particularly in psychology and team psychology kinds of studies. Um, NASA and ESA actually run some of their own expediting, expeditionary sorts of, of studies as well. Um, there's one in Europe called CAVES that you might be familiar with that astronauts just rave about. Uh, they send a, a team of, of astronauts deep into a cave somewhere in Italy. Uh, this is unexplored territory, and the job of the team is to explore some of the territory. They're actually in a situation that's potentially dangerous, which is a feature that is relatively unusual in most analogs. And it changes the way that people think and the way that people act in a team together. So these analogs are really valuable. Yeah, it's, it's actually a NASA astronaut who first told me about caves. And I think I'll be applying soon. Okay, good. Uh, my friend Mike Barrett thinks the caves experience is the absolute closest to a real spaceflight experience. He, he thinks that was the, the best prep he got. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, even on like, Hawaii <laughs> at high seas. It's it's quite extraordinary the terrain there. And to the audience, I'd I'd encourage you to apply to these high she high seas missions. Which brings me to my next question, which is, what would be your advice to the young men and women listening to us, uh, especially the ones who want to apply to these astronaut missions on Earth or on the Moon? Well, I first of all go for it you know if, if you if it interests you in any shape or form you know it, it's worth a try uh of course you know do your best to prepare your application as much as possible um and uh study uh, you know what missions are like what astronauts are like uh just to really have the right background knowledge before you apply in the first place uh, at this point it's difficult to get any you know additional experience in time for the the selection deadline so really just just try your best to justify why you know you're a good candidate what you can bring um, and think about important aspects of space exploration which a big part of it is teamwork working together well communication empathy uh, patience, all these things, and ask yourself if, if you know you have that, or if you can work on that, and and then definitely give it a shot. Virginia, do you, would you like to add to that? After that, I'll ask the last question for the day. How can you how can you add to uh, you know get out there and try things? Um, yeah, it's it's not that hard, I think, to to um, think of ways to make yourself to be a better candidate. Um, try some of the analog astronaut experiences. Uh, learn a language. Do team things. All of these um, improve your odds in the in the selection. Yeah, to add that add to that from a personal perspective, I think. I've I've always had this dream of being an astronaut one day, and to build towards that dream, I've had to uh, 
make myself try many different things. And I think it just ended up making me a bit more, a bit better as a person. So it's never a lost cause, you know, to apply to an astronaut. Bianca, and that's so... really well said. <laughs> Thank you. So that's for the final well question said. of so for the final question Sorry. of today, uh, okay. So for the two of you, what would be for you the perfect crew that you'd like to see on the ISS or the Lunar Gateway or any future space mission in the upcoming years? Oh, wow. Well, uh, you know, perfect is a strong word. <laughs> you never, never really you know, achieve perfection in such a way. But in an ideal world, a very diverse crew, diverse in terms of gender, cultural heritage and background, expertise. You know, the, the more diverse, the, the more perspective um, you know, it will bring to the mission. Each person is different, will bring their own experiences, heritage and things like that and it will uh, just make that be a much better experience. Perhaps uh, it will help the astronaut to work better together uh, facing challenges because you can think out of the box better when you have people with different perspectives, solve problems but also create new you know wonderful experiments or outreach projects, things like that. In my experience, yeah, the more diverse the crew, uh, the better the overall outcome of a mission. Um, so that that's what I would hope for. Absolutely, um, you need you need more skills than you have people, and and that means that each person has to have more than one kind of skill. And so you need you need good communicators. Uh, both to keep the team intact and to uh, do education and outreach. You need people who are good at fixing things because pe things are going to break. You need people who can think on their feet because things are going to happen that no one expected. You need, um, you need folks who can do different kinds of experiments that get done on the space station, and those range from physics to biology to materials science to geology, I mean everything. Uh, right now, one of my favorite people is on Space Station, and that's Kate Rubens. And she's one of my favorites because she can do the kinds of experiments that I really like to see data from. Um, so a, a big mix of skills and abilities is, is really important. And then at the same time, you want people who can manage to get along with each other. And a lot of that is just being calm and reasonable and trying to communicate. That Those are great answers. And um, I see that Michaela already gave her um, a contact details and Virginia as well uh, in your slides. So I would encourage the speaker uh, to the audience if you have more questions to reach out to them. And this break, brings us to the end of our masterclass. I would really like to thank our speakers and to our amazing, amazing audience for being so uh, engaged. And um, so wrapping up, we see that we did have a lot of people from very, various different places on our planet. Not, unfortunately, not from the moon or Mars yet. And there are so many who really want to apply to the next ESA astronaut selections. And so, do tune in. Our next webinar will be on tips to apply for the astronaut selections and uh, see you in a month's time. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's great talking to you all and uh, great questions and uh, greetings from the moon. Aloha. <laughs> Good luck with your mission. <laughs> thank you. Good thank luck. you. Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Feel free to contact us if you want. Yes, please. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.